myself a little bit. Thank you, Margaret. So, um, I mentioned out here that my password is bug lover. <laughs> don't, don't try to hack into my bank account, so there's not much money in it. Um, but it, it, it really conveys, absolutely, um, my passion for microbes. I, I was serious when I said when I was an undergraduate and I saw those swimming things under the microscope, I was absolutely flabbergasted. So that has been, that moment that happened has just marked my whole life. I may just cry through this talk. <laughs> and so um, what I really want to do for you today, because I want you to really feel the, the beauty of microbes, is sort of go through that. Now, I am a bureaucrat along. So I will show data, okay? I will show government data, so forgive me. But part of the reason I want to show government data is to wow you about the amount of money that has already gone into this deal. And frankly, it's just going to be the tip of the iceberg. So, so please forgive me in advance if I show you graphs with dollar amounts. <laughs> okay, I asked Al if I could just be mic'd with a lavalier because I'm too short for these podia. So I decided to call this listening to the microbe song because I was coming to Hawaii and trying to make some kind of connection with the Hawaii, so I think about whale song and all that. But it also describes how we're doing this work. We're trying to delve into these communities, peek into these communities, listen to what they're doing and who they're talking to. So I hope that listening to the microbe song is still evocative of what I want to do today. So I'm going to start with first principles. What are microbes? And the reason I ask is it's a sloppy term. It's used in a lot of different contexts. It's OK to use it. But understand, it doesn't just mean bacteria. It means bacteria. It means viruses. It means all these pictures I have on the wall here. And really, it's microscopic life. And the beauty of microscopic life in nature is they don't live alone. So they don't grow well on petri dishes because they don't live alone. They require microbial partners. And when they work as communities with, with, in partnership with other microbes, they interact in communities, they do wonders. They get together and they can break down, metabolize on, on anything. So that's the beauty of microbes in nature. And so they look more like this. Okay, a big gamish of different species talking to each other, sometimes in intimate contact, sometimes far away, but always, always the talking to each other and trying to figure out a way to metabolize a substrate. Okay. So when you isolate them separately, you remove their partners. And that's probably been one of the most important things that we've learned about the study of microbes is we deceived ourselves as to what they're doing because we removed all the partners in that conversation. So much of modern microbiome science is trying to keep them together and trying to understand how they are conversing, how they, they are singing, if you will, together. And in fact, we live in a microbial world. This entire planet and all the life forms on it rely on microbes. Okay, uh, Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, but we have evidence of life on this planet, all microbial, arising at about 3.8 billion years ago. And in fact, over half of our planet's history was dominated by only microbial life forms, two point, about 2.3 billion years. <coughs> I'd wait, I want to go back for a second. And part of the important thing that happened, not the only thing, but part of the important thing that happened, am I okay, Robert? Are you getting feedback? A little bit, but I think Okay, Al, Al would know. He's my dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, where I'm going with this is that microbes did all kinds of things, but maybe one of the most fundamental things that microbes did in these early periods when they were conditioning Earth is they produced oxygen. Photosynthetic microbes produce oxygen. Okay. And if you go to the Bishop Museum tomorrow at 4 o'clock, I'm going to develop that idea more if you're interested in that aspect of, of the impact of microbes on this planet. But they produce oxygen. And once oxygen was produced, that really allowed for the development of much more complex life forms and multicellular life forms. So then you start to have all these different multicellular life forms arising again from a microbial 
function, microbial symbiosis. So you've already heard, know that nuclei, mitochondria, chloroplasts, and so on are as a result of microbial symbiosis back in the day. And most of the genetic diversity in the tree of life is microbial. So many of you probably see the old Hankel tree, which looks like a literal tree with man on top. But with new modern tools, and I don't like this pointer because I think it jumps around. I don't know where it is right now. But anyway, um, if you actually, there's a modern way of looking at, at life on this planet using genetic tools and evolutionary relationships. And we're down here in the corner, okay, in a tippy tippy corner. And even much of this eukaryotic arm of the tree of life is microbial. And all that stuff at the top is microbial. We don't see it, that's part of our blinders, right? We don't see it, but this earth is dominated by microbes. And of course, microbes live in symbiosis with all life. They either rely on microbes or they live in intimate contact um, with plants, animals, and humans. But of course, what's happened through human history is that um, we didn't know about the good microbes because most of our uh, major contact with microbes has been the bad ones, right? If you, if you just a casual reading of human history, there have been many, many plagues and epidemics that have done major damage to entire society and entire civilizations. So we kind of, over decades and hundreds and thousands of years, we kind of got the idea, oh, no, 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 these things are bad, 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 they're all germs. Um, I just named a few, a, a few epidemics and so on. But with uh, people who develop vaccines or antibiotics, um, we started to tackle uh, these infectious agents, these pathogens. Uh, but our focus was still on thinking, okay, these things are all deadly, all pathogens. But starting in about the 1970s, I think most of the early work was actually in the water treatment plants and places like that, practical reasons, trying to figure out whether in fact the treatment, uh, treatments actually did clean water. There were a number of important direct studies of microbes in nature. We actually trying to grow them on a, a petri dish, go right to nature and see where the microbes are. So in the 70s, we started a whole suite of approaches to directly study microbes in nature using stains and dyes and so on. And then as a result of a real revolution that was happening in another field around the evolutionary relationships of, of life on the planet, we were able, in starting in the 1980s, build probes that were specific for particular groups of organisms and begin to study bacteria in nature using what's called, and the most classic one is the 16S ribosomal RNA analysis of bacteria in nature. You actually develop fluorescent dyes specifically for bacteria, known classes of bacteria, and you take those dyes and you look in natural samples and you can count them. Then starting in the 2000s, there's always a lag. All the uh, ecologists and environmental scientists get the techniques out first, and then somewhere along the road come the biomedical types who adopt the techniques for studying the human. So in the 2000s, you start to see that same kind of analysis happening in the human. And so that's when we started to say, oh, look at this. There are now a huge plethora, of an entire garden of microbes growing all over the human body. And in fact, in 2007, the National Academy wrote a report to really laud this and to really argue that this discovery of this diversity and richness of microbes in nature that are not germs, that are not pathogens, are almost unknown to us, but now we have the tools to begin to study them. So let's do a little bit of uh, comparison and contrast here for a moment. Most of us usually think of microbes as germs, but actually if you count up all human pathogens, could be viruses, could be fungi, could be bacteria, there's only a little over a thousand, a little over a thousand. I mean, you think about all the impact that these germs have had on, on human society, it's a lot, but there aren't that many of them. That's my point. And that's actually against the background of trillions of microbial species all over this place, okay? 
So this little tiny minority has done a lot of damage, but it's also caused us to not pay attention to the others that are the, the beneficials. Okay, so my point is that in fact, the majority of microbes don't cause disease. In fact, many are beneficial. And microbes on Earth do all kinds of things, okay? They produce soil and regenerate soil. Yes, physical weathering can produce soil, but without microbes, soils can't be nutrient rich. It's the microbial activity in soil that makes soil rich for crops and plants. Oxygen production. Let's take two breaths. That second breath, that second breath came from the ocean, from oceanic microbes, photosynthetic microbes producing oxygen. So 50%, approximately 50% of the oxygen on this planet is produced by these invisible to your eye, but hugely abundant microbes that live in the oceans. <coughs> then the base of all food was. Um, what, I, what I mean by that is microbes can be food to other organisms, maybe inverted to these um, microbes, as well as playing a major role in nutrient regeneration by our nutrients. And of course, they support all plant, animal, and human health. So bacteria are my friends. They should be yours too. <laughs> Here's a few kind of, I'll call them cocktail party facts, you know, if you want to, you know, that, that's, you know, at least I quote these numbers and things, you know, next time you want to show your, your, your chops about the microbiome. Um, there's thousands of microbial species living on every epithelial surface of the body in and out. And in fact, I can't even make that statement anymore because there are scientists that are showing that on your skin, so I always thought microbes were going on my skin. It turns out that there's strong evidence that within your skin are microbial populations interacting with the immune system with these dendrites. Okay? There's a lot of discussion going on right now about whether the placenta in a pregnant woman has an associated microbiome. Okay, so the, the old story was every epithelial surface has an associated microbiome. We may be limiting ourselves by making that statement. But in fact, most are living on epithelial surfaces. I tried to come up with a quick way of describing that, so I'm showing you different body regions the general surface areas of those batter body reefs and the general densities, you can see they're incredibly numerous. Okay, and there are many, genera is a provision, not biologist, just a way to categorize microbes. So it means that there's, so species is more detailed than genera, so that's just genera. Under there are thousands of species, okay. And collectively, we've coined the term microbiome uh, to mean this whole collection of microbes that live in and on our body. I mentioned breast milk, that's something that's kind of new. Turns out there may be, in fact, a breast milk microbiome. What it's doing there, what contributions it makes to the offspring, all those are yet to be known. We acquire, we acquire these microbes every generation, okay? So I'm having a great conversation with Margaret this morning over breakfast, and she taught me a term facilitated horizontal transfer. I thought it was vertical transmission because um, of the mechanism, but in fact, it, it, she's corrected me, so I'm gonna be clear. Okay. Facilitated horizontal transmission. But basically, uh, there is a process, a very important process, two processes actually, that occur that nature meant to guarantee this transfer of microbes. Number one, um, when a woman is pregnant, her vaginal microbiome, the microbes that live in there, start to change. And the beneficial ones become enriched, and the ones that don't really do much drop off, okay? So when the baby's born vaginally, so it's in the birth canal, there's a lot of goopy, goopy mucus, right? And there's this kind of, is somebody laughing? Am I gross? Am I gross? Am I, you know what? I give talks and I gross people out all the time. So, you, know, you can laugh, you can go, hey, or whatever you want to do. Go ahead. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead. <laughs> um, the mucus is now laden with all these beneficial microbes, and here comes the baby, and it gets coated in the mucus. Okay, it's a vehicle. It's a it's a vehicle for transmitting uh, an initial inoculum microbes to to the infant. 
Um, the child is what we call micromagnets. They're meant to acquire microbes. Those of you who are parents, and you know you send your kids to daycare, you know all those microbes they acquire. Well, you don't like that part, but it's part of a natural mechanism. They're meant to pick up microbes because that's essential to the, and I'll get to that in a minute, essential to the development of their own immune system. Okay? So these millions of genes that I just mentioned encode this myriad of metabolic capabilities. These are my cocktail party facts. Um, the gut microbiome in an adult weighs about the same as the brain. So you got three pounds of microbes down here, you got three pounds of brain up here, and it has the metabolic capacity of the liver. Okay? And in fact, the human microbiome augments, extends, and supports those capabilities encoded in the human genome because it's a paltry number of genes at 23,000. Now, my home at NIH is the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I cannot tell you how many awkward conversations I have had with my colleagues because, of course, I'm the bug lover and they're the human genome that you know, does everything. I don't know that I've convinced them all, but I have begun to turn some of my colleagues around on this idea. But it's true. We know now that the human genome is about 20 to 25,000 names. And yet, that's like a paltry amount compared to the millions of genes. And evolution, you know, it's, a, it's, it's like a partnership. You know, well, you need this, I'll come along and give it to you. The human body in an adult finally matures into an ecosystem of microbial habitats. This type of data here is called a PCOA plot, and it's a way to collapse really complex data into a visual way to be able to think about it. So each one of these dots, I don't know if I have this, I do. Each one of these dots, okay, is a sample taken from that body site, whether it's GLI tract, oral, nary, skin, or your genital. The DNA is extracted and sequenced and analyzed, and then we try to compare between habitats or between people. So one of those dots is an individual and their GI microbiome, another individual in the oral microbiome, okay? And what I want to show you here without going into the statistics is that the GI microbiome and the oral microbiome are as different as Hawaii and the continent in terms of the makeup and, and complexity and diversity. And in this audience, our gut microbiome, all of us, is more alike than my oral microbiome and my gut microbiome. I might as well be two different continents, but here we're like one collective of, of uh, islands, I guess. And the microbiome and host interact. This is a highly co evolved system. They interact to help digest the indigestibles in the host site. And in fact, they ferment the plant material um, to produce their own energy sources. I just want to show you on the right. In fact, I'll stop for a second. Let me just show you on the right, because I find these images, I'm a very visual person, so I find these images are amazing. At the top is a gut cross-section. The blue are the gut, uh, gut cells, so your gut lining, okay? And then there's this tiny 50 micron thick layer of mucus that has to be sustained, because in fact, we have kind of a microbial detente with our microbes, so if they enter and touch the gut wall, then in fact they can start to penetrate the from. So we really need that gut, that, that mucus layer. And then that sort of purple and pink area are whole, all kinds of different gut microbes. Below is a similar colorized photograph, micrograph of an oral biofilm. So this morning, you brush your teeth and you had some schmutz here in the corner. If you were to take that schmutz, and stay in, it would be this gorgeous thing full of all kinds of wonderful microbes. And do you know that in your mouth, there are at least nine microbial habitats? Right now I'm talking to you, and my tongue is slapping the roof of my mouth, but the microbes on my tongue are totally different than the ones that are growing on my palate and the roof of my mouth. And the microbes that grow right here at the tippy edge of my tooth are totally different than the ones that are growing right there under my gum. Nine different microbial habitats and nine different communities just in your mouth. 
So they di help digest the injectables, they help educate the immune system to recognize self from non-self. There's a whole lecture, that separate lecture I could give about how the reason that as babies are meant to acquire microbes is they don't have a developed immune system yet. So as their immune system develops, those microbes become part of the, this is part of the immune system. These microbes belong here. Type of communication happens in the body. So self and non-self. They produce energy sources for our host cells. Specifically, the best example I can provide is, you may recall from high school biology that most of our cells use glucose, but not in the gut. In the gut, short chain fatty acids like acetate that are fermentation byproducts from fermentation that happens in your gut is the major energy source for the gut cells. Okay, that's a highly evolved process. They use a totally different energy source, and they rely on microbes to supply it. Um, microbes produce all manner of beneficial compounds to their hosts, like vitamins and antimicrobials. And there's a really hot area of research in which it's quite clear that the gut microbiome is communicating with the brain. And also, gut microbiome communicating and affecting the a lot of neurotransmitters, for whatever reason, are made down here in the gut. I don't think we entirely understand what the communication links are, but there's a lot of information that shows us that the gut microbiome and their activities affects brain development and behavior and mental health and so on. Okay, but what is, so, so what's also come, come about is another field looking at um, disease transmission and so on, um, as it was obviously over here to the left, as a result of the use of vaccines and antibiotics, in most cases, not entirely, but in most, most cases, we've managed to actually decrease the incidence of infectious disease through the use of vaccines and antibiotics. But what epidemiologists have also seen mm -hmm. is this kind of mirror image explosion of allergic and autoimmune diseases. You know, what's going on there, they're asking. What are we doing that we're somehow causing this extraordinary increase in a huge array of allergic and autoimmune diseases? So what's causing the appearance of these common diseases? Okay, and then another group of scientists are asking another kind of question. There was a beautiful paper written in 2009 in which two scientists postulated and were concerned that in fact, there may be the systematic loss of these microbes from by generations because of various practices. Things that we rely on, things that we think are good, okay? Look, I like clean water, you know, I don't know what else I like on that list, but I like clean water. But many of us live indoors, are not exposed to even the outdoors. Caesarean birth, which short circuits the, the uh, transfer of microbes to the baby. Um, antibiotic use and overuse, low fiber diet. You know, most of us don't even meet the USDA requirement for fiber, daily fiber intake. And why do we care about fiber? Because it's the food for the microbes in our gut. So if you starve your microbes, they're not gonna be happy and some other microbes are gonna take over. So low fiber diet, processed foods. The reason processed foods are a problem, they're, they kind of, to my mind, the way I think about it, they're kind of equivalent to food that's already been partially digested. So not much gets down to your large colon. So you're kind of starving your microbes if you eat processed foods, because it's too easy for your own body to digest. I'm learning recently about all manner of food additives being a problem. I think one of the big ones recently is emulsifiers. Okay, if you eat like ice cream or chocolate milk or peanut butter or whatever, they always add emulsifiers because they want to stabilize the food. You don't want it to separate in a jar or a can or whatever. Well, what's happening with emulsifiers apparently is that it's causing this, um, you remember when I told you there was this 50 micron mucus layer and actually the microbes play a, a major role in maintaining what's called the tight junctions but in this, between the cells in the gut? Well, emulsifiers are bypassing all that and allowing gut contents to move outside the gut. So if you eat emulsifiers, apparently you're so short circuiting that entire process and stuff in your gut that should remain in your gut is leaving your gut and going um, to other parts of your body. And apparently lupus is a kind of disease that suffers from 
the presence of leaky gut or gut content leaving the gut and, and moving to other parts of the body. So all these things, which in most cases we think are good, are having unintended consequences. So these two scientists are saying, with all these different practices, are we having this sort of systematic generational impact on the richness of the microbes that live in our bodies? <laughs> and in fact, in fact, there are definitely data that are showing this. And I want to talk about these two graphs from different papers. Over here, and I'm not going to use the pointer because I noticed that when you use the pointer, it kind of drifts and goes in lots of different directions. So you have to trust my verbal description. On the left, okay, the title here is microbial diversity does appear to be decreasing across populations and across generations. And I think this will be particularly important to this Hawaiian community. So here, what they've done is taken, I don't know, two dozen different populations from around the world and studied the diversity of their gut microbiome but they've been grouped into three kinds of populations. At the very top, the top six or so, live in jungle or savanna and are hunter-gatherers, okay? And they collect their own food. The people in the middle, rural, they live in rural populations, they may be farmers, but they live in rural populations. And in the bottom dozen or so, starting with Japan and ending in Ireland, are all what we would call modern societies living in urban environments. Look at that trend, amazing trend, in drop in microbial diversity mm. across these populations, possibly due to these lifestyles. I think that's what you've got to hypothesize. Over here, loss of microbial diversity over generations. This is an example where they looked at populations who live in one, I think this was a Vietnamese maybe, I don't remember right now, um, somewhere in Southeast Asia. Okay, so they measured their microbial diversity in the gut before they immigrated. Then they immigrate to the mainland. They didn't talk about Hawaii, but they immigrated to the mainland. And within a very short time, they started to see a, a change in the gut microbiome, and they start, they're starting to gain weight. BMI is increasing, okay? Then after they've lived in the US for a while, long time residents, their BMI goes even higher, their microbial diversity even lower. And then the next generation of that immigrant population has a BMI and low diversity like European Americans that have been here for generations. It only takes two generations to totally radically alter one's gut microbiome when you immigrate from wherever your home country was to come to the US. Okay, so that's what Stan Falco and Marty Blade have predicted in 2009 has happened. It is happening. So here's where the human microbiome project comes in. And I think a lot of my slides coming up are going to be full of like graphs about budgets and numbers. I'm trying to sell it. Uh, but so the, 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 the thing was that a lot of these ideas were coming up. So NIH listened. And they said, you know what? We have an opportunity to contribute to this by developing a toolbox of research tools to allow the research community to explore these questions they're concerned about. And I call that timing and opportunity because, in fact, at the end of the Human Genome Project, um, there was a lot of um, capacity. Genome sequences, sequencing centers were available. They had just announced the human genome had been sequenced. There was a lot of technology that had improved, so they were more affordable. And the cost of per genome was dropping like crazy. So that's 2000 you can see the cost is very high, and right about the uh, middle of the 2000s, you start to see the precipitous drop in the, in the cost of sequencing. And the NIH was concerned about cost because it would, even though it was super expensive to sequence a human genome, based on what the microbiology committee was telling the NIH, they were kind of flabbergasted. They were concerned they were just going to go bankrupt trying to sequence the microbiome because of the diversity and the complexity. But they realized that the drop in sequencing, they could afford to do it. And also another timing opportunity thing was, NIH is, a, is, amazing, is a major funding agency. It's got a 30 or $32 billion per year budget, but it's got 27 institutes and centers. So they take the human body and they cut it up into 27 different components, right? And they're all siloed, right? And then of course, as you might well imagine, there's also a lot of gaps and redundancies, right? 
So Congress said, we're not doing this. So they created something called the Common Fund under the office of the director in order to uh, ask NIH to look for things of the trans-NIH interest. And they had a budget to be able to fund those things. So the Human Microbiome Project was funded under the Common Fund um, to sequence what they called the other genome. That was the other kind of catchphrase of the microbiome, the other genome, right? So the Common Fund's first project out the door was the Human Microbiome Project, and they devoted $215 million in 10 years to build this research toolbox. Our job was, here's a brand new field, what do these scientists need to get started? And that was our entire mandate. So as I mentioned, in the 70s, we started developing tools to, to directly study microbes in nature. Now, this is the next phase of studying microbes in nature. We're not just looking at them under the microscope, we start studying them, studying their DNA. So we have the ability, I already mentioned, to use specific markers to look at bacteria in samples. We also started to develop the capacity to, to sequence single microbial genomes, but maybe most importantly, it's called metagenomic sequencing because it's multiple genomes. We were able to now be begin to analyze total microbial communities. As well as the development of other high technologies to measure the metabolites, the gene expression, and other major biological properties of microbial communities, including these brand apparently brand new discoveries microbial proteins. So HNP had two phases, two phases. Again, remember, building a toolbox. Okay, the first phase was to try to characterize microbiomes, so the tools and the approaches for that were developed, and then see if they correlated with phenotypes. It was kind of a naive approach. You know, if, if, you, if a health person is healthy, do they have a characteristic healthy microbiome? Is the person have type of diabetes? Do they have a type of diabetes microbiome, and so on? So we had this amazing, what we call the benchmark healthy cohort study, in which 300 adult men and women were verified to be free of disease by clinicians before enrolling in the cohort. What do I mean with? When I go to my doctor for my annual exam, I get my blood drawn, I, I donate some urine, he checks my blood pressure, you know, a few things like that. I'm talking about a clinician verifying that I have no skin disease, another clinician saying I have no GI disease, and so on and so on and so on. And even though these were young people on the average age of about 25 or 26, 80 percent of these Americans had oral disease. <coughs> Okay, and, and we had to raise the BMI for entry into the cohort because nobody could meet that lower BMI level. So then we had to send all these people out to their dentists and periodontists and whatever else to get their dental caries, their gum disease, and everything else uh, repaired, cleanse the antibiotics from their body before they could re-enroll in the cohort. So even though we're going after a healthy group, it was hard to find healthy. It was hard to find healthy. Okay, so we analyzed uh, the, gut mark, the five areas, gut, you know, gut, skin, nares, mouth, and uh, your general of these 300 people to really ask the question, who's there, and does it correlate with phenotype? And the answer is, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. You cannot just name the microbes, you know, with, with a sequence analysis and say, yes, I know what health status that person is in. And I'll give you a tiny, tiny little example why you can't just name the microbe. Okay, there's a microbe that lives in our body, in our gut, called E. coli. You've heard of E. coli, everybody's heard of E. coli. Okay? You've probably also heard of Taco Bell E. coli. Okay? <laughs> it's still called E. coli. One of them will kill you. Okay, so you can't just name the microbe to know what it does. And yet, we um, set out asking that kind of question and found that we couldn't stop there. And the demonstration projects were for diseases like we had these 12 demonstration projects to see if we could demonstrate that there was a characteristic microbiome associated with disease. So, you know, I think it was some one type of diabetes cohort and one creature with birth cohort. We had a bunch of these. And so we developed the tools for sequencing the microbiome, but we realized we couldn't stop there because you can't just name the microbe or characterize the microbial community and get at 
the condition of the, of the person. So we had a phase two, okay? This one was, what are they doing? We already know we can't just ask who's there. We also have to know what they're doing. So there was an entire expansion of other properties that were collected from three different cohorts, and we also tracked the host properties over time of a type 2 diabetes cohort, an IBE cohort, and a preterm birth cohort. And even if you don't care about those conditions, the point was this was a rich data set carefully vetted. All of the data were there and available to anybody who wanted to sit and analyze the data. They were referenced data sets so that anybody who wanted to jump in and look at it can kind of do like dry experiments without spending the money. I mean, that's a real bonus for a lot of scientists. They don't have to spend the money. They can test some of their ideas in a carefully vetted reference data set. And so all those data went into our HMP Data Analysis Coordination Center. You can go there, you can download there, you can look at the protocols, you can look at the pipelines, you can look at the computational tools, you can play around with the data. There's all kinds of things you can do. So we met our goal of trying to build out this toolbox. Don't worry about it. Oh, I didn't want to talk about this. And at the same time, even though it was a, not a deliberate goal of the HMP, we also created a research community. Because we, we functioned as a consortium. We had a bazillion conference calls and meetings, and we're always talking about QCing this and referencing that and round robbing this and so on. So there was a lot of interaction across these members of the HMP consortium. And that actually launched the research community in the U.S. because so many were involved in the HMP. Okay, here comes the numbers. So these are for like the upper administration and other people who care about funding. Now, I, we built a toolbox. Did anybody care? Well, here is what captures that it would completely democratize human microbiome research in this country. That the data on red, is the HMP data per year, starting in 2007, the budget, mm. okay? Then I figured out a way to find the budget for the other HM, uh, the other non-HMP human microbiome projects. And look at that explosion of support, okay? So that total over 10 years totals $880 million. So we catalyzed the field by providing the toolbox in the beginning, and then people jumped on board and were able to use the tools to ask questions about their own disease of interest, okay? And I tell you here, these are a thousand plus studies. I read the, the proposals, I read the studies. All of them reference the HMP reference data and tools as the basis for the study of the microbiome in their disease of interest. We completely succeeded in, in providing the toolbox that was needed. And I told you there are 27 instances at NIH Currently, 21 of them fund in this area. In the beginning, it was like five. Okay, and I, we published a paper on this deep analysis of what was being funded in this area at the NIH to ever care about. And here's sort of a, a cartoon of the different kinds of diseases that are that are being studied. I just show you here in the corner. This sort of a, a close-up of, of the last five years of that 10-year window. A total of $728 million, two-thirds of it was on disease. But for those of you who care about basic biology, a very healthy one-third was on, on basic biology. Nothing to do with disease. Because it was such a new area, there were so many fundamental questions we had about the microbiome that a very healthy $262 million over just a five-year period was devoted to the basic biology of microbiome. Okay, 100 plus classes of disease, and these are the World Health Organization category of classes, ICD-10. 100 plus classes of disease are being studied at that area. Name it, it's probably being studied. Okay, this is just a little snapshot. And I use the word association because it's too soon. We don't have cause and effect. So there's no yet evidence that a microbiome causes disease, but there's some kind of connection. Something's going on with changes in the microbiome that is somehow exacerbating or somehow interacting with and causing disease. And here's some surprises. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes surprised me. Lupus surprised me. 
multiple sclerosis surprised me, even autism surprised me. There are old ideas about the role of microbes in cancer. That whole idea has been completely resurrected by the National Cancer Institute. There are many, many kinds of cancers that are being studied and at the, with, uh, with regard to the role of microbes in those cancers, GI tract diseases, heart diseases, and so on and so forth. And it kind of makes sense, right? If you got this central thing happening in your body and it's disturbed, you start seeing all of these impacts across all kinds of health conditions. It's not a big surprise that we're looking at 100 plus classes of disease. I mean, it's an eye opener, but when you stop and think about it, it's not a big surprise. Okay, now what I want to do is transition to environmental microbiomes because I don't want you to walk away from this discussion, from this lecture, thinking, oh, well, you're not just about humans, right? No, it's not. There are scientists studying the role of what we call atmospheric microbiome. Aeolian transport, you know that term? It's like global winds that pick up material from one continent and carry it to another. There's aeolian transport of microbes from the Saharan desert to the coral reefs, including fungal spores that probably are causing fungal disease in coral reefs. War fighters, the Department of Defense is into the microbiome in a big, big way. And soldiers are now called war fighters. That's the new term. Because they're deployed all over the world, they're highly stressed, they're introduced to a different diet, and they lose a, a large fraction of their war fighters to sickness. So the Department of Defense is trying very hard to develop healthy diets, gut-friendly diets, and things like that for their war fighters so they don't lose so many soldiers before they even uh, Deploy, uh, engage in whatever it is there to do. Livestock and poultry. Most of you know, most of you know, that in our country we have, I don't think the term is monocultures, but single strains of cows that we raise for dairy or meat or whatever, and single kinds of poultry, and we dose everything with antibiotics because we have a close quarters for all these livestock. We have completely ignored that all these animals have their own natural microbiome. And now there are some communities that are trying to find a way to rediscover, for example, the rumen microbiome in cows and seeing how can we better support that to have healthier, healthier livestock. Soil and crop. It's even worse with plants and crops. You know, we grow monocultures of corn or monocultures of wheat or whatever, and they've been um, bred so much that they've lost their natural root microbiome that they live with in, in the wild strains. So now there are agronomists trying to rediscover those natural wild strains and see if we can rediscover the natural microbial communities that live with them. Because plants don't move, right? They're kind of, it's kind of a weird lifestyle. They don't move. <laughs> and so they're constantly bombarded with with, with all kinds of you know germs and infectious agents, and in fact, what happens is they produce, they nurture and they nurture a very rich microbial community to, to help them fight disease. But we've removed all those microbes; they're still standing there in the soil. And so, what we have to do is dose them down with all kinds of pesticides and, and stuff to, so they can be protected. So now we want to rediscover the natural. Coral reefs, you guys already know this in Hawaii, they're dying like crazy. There's a natural microbial community associated with coral reefs, but they're highly stressed, and uh, we need to find a way to restore coral reefs by also learning about better about their microbiome and their defense mechanisms. You may not know this, but NASA's into the microbiome in a big way, because supposedly we're going to go to Mars or something, I guess. Maybe Elon Musk is going to send us to Mars. But the point is, with the International Space Station, they've learned a lot about the gut microbiome. It turns out that the longer an astronaut stays up in space, even though they live in microgravity, two bad things happen. Their immune system gets weaker and weaker and weaker, and at the same time, virulent microbes become more virulent. So it's a kind of a double whammy. And so um, they did that experiment with the twin astronauts, and I don't remember the one that was up in the eye. Was it Mark Kelly? It was, anyway. He's, he's not in good shape because he was up here for a year. Oh. And so they're trying to figure out how, you know, how do we fix that? If we're going to go to Mars or the moon or whatever, I mean, people are going to die along the way unless we can find a way to make sure that their immune system is more robust and remains robust. And that includes the microbiome because Mark Kelly's microbiome went haywire too when he's up there for a year. 
ocean. I mean, that's a given, right? It's already told you that of every two graphs you take, one of them comes from the ocean. They're also a major carbon sink, you know about that. If you're really kind of even casually about global climate change, you know, the oceans are the lungs of the planet, right? And the, mi the, the most populous populations of microbes are in the oceans. So we really got to make sure we understand what they're doing in and what they need to maintain their most robust abilities. And finally, um, because we live in indoors all of our lives, it turns out that, and people have done this, you can go to someone's home and you can figure out who lives there. Uh, because they, we, 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 we shed, I wish I remember the number, we shed an extraordinary number of skin cells in a 24 hour period. We also exude a lot of microbes through breathing, through movement, everything else. So all our indoor system, if I were to swab this entire auditorium, it'd be laden with microbes because we've shed them. So the reason that even matters is because we have a modern indoor lifestyle and we shed so many microbes so that we actually create indoor microbiomes. And it's particularly important in places like hospitals and daycares that are trying to figure out how can we change the architecture of hospitals and daycare centers so we can reduce the potential burden of microbes in those environments. So that's another area. So these are all areas outside of just the human health area that I've talked about in which the field of microbial sciences is making a major, major impact. So the White House, I had the great privilege Wow, during the Obama administration, there were so many wonderful things that happened. So many wonderful things that happened. You know, I feel like it was a dream. <laughs> but I had a chance to work in this White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy. And it was a committee that was formed. Of course, it's a government. It's got to be a committee. It's called the Fast Track Action Committee, Mapping the Microbiome. And we were chartered and required to collect data. Oh, and these are all the different agencies that were involved. Okay. To collect data, the question was, how much are we really funding in the microbiome area? So they, we, they farmed this out and they said, go collect that data. And in fact, we identified over a three-year fiscal period, almost a billion dollars, not just in human microbiome, but almost a billion dollars of research in the microbiome. Of course, NIH was a very large fraction, but look at the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, look at all the agencies that were involved. Okay, so many, many federal funding agencies across the entire U.S. government has been and is funding in the larger microbiome area. And it's, and it's, it's occurring in lots of different habitats. We identified eight systems Agriculture, aquatic, atmospheric, built environment, human energy, non-human and a lab, that means like animal models, and terrestrial. That $922 billion was apportioned this way, about a third to human, 29 to animal, and so on. But the point was, it's not only human microbiome. There's rich research going on across many, many different systems. And that excited the White House. You know, I, you, you folks may not know this, but President Obama is a complete science nerd. He loves science. And it turns out he got completely turned on about microbes. He gave a State of the Union address in, oh gosh, I wish I could remember one, 2014 it was, where he used the word microbe twice. <laughs> 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 was launched, and the reason that you should even care is, you know, the federal government is a big behemoth and a lot, you know, it moves so slow and can never talk, get the different parts to talk to each other, but when you create an initiative, what it does is it gives us permission to collaborate and coordinate. So all these federal agencies got together and uh, created this micro, you know, none of the committee, right? Microbiome Air Agency Working Group to develop a federal plan Okay, here's this amazing new area with all these with all these implications. What can we do? Well, we can certainly try to coordinate. Um, we can develop new technology, and more. Maybe most importantly, it's time.
time to build the microbiome workforce. We have what we need, we got the tools, the questions. Now let's just educate the next generation. But I will tell you, I'm gonna give you a slight downer. This happened in 2016. Guess what happened after that? Okay, and so we've, we've kind of gone underground. Uh, well, we're working, but at a kind of a, you know underground level. So even though the National Microbiome Initiative is, 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 is there, uh, we can't, so we, if it's some things we can't do, that chartering by the White House, it's a real formal process. It has to be like approved and stamped and agreed, you know, he has to sign, or she, whoever the president is. So, um, uh, so, so, but you know, we still have our connections and all that. We're doing certain things, okay? So for example, the Phytobiome Initiative was born out of this excitement out of the National Microbiome Initiative. This has to do with trying to understand you know, the plant-soil microbe interactions, kind of basically going, uh, I think agriculture is going through a renaissance because they're rediscovering soil microbes and their fundamental roles they're playing. So this Phytobiome Initiative is a grassroots organization basically trying to find a way to develop networks across the research teams um, that are working in this area. They birthed a journal, they have an alliance, and so on. Um, DOE, even though they're not in a National Microbiome Initiative, they've gone ahead and decided they're gonna to try to develop another resource, a, a, not a toolbox per se, but another resource for the environmental area. And it was a takeoff from the HMP. HMP built a toolbox, so now it's time to build a toolbox for the environmental field. And it's called the National Microbiome Data Collaborative. I'm on the science advisory board for this group, but they've gone ahead even though there isn't an MI, so that's what they are. And what's really amazing, what's really amazing to me, again, this is grassroots. Last year, um, we identified about three dozen universities around the country that had microbiome groups that, that maybe their deans or their provosts or whatever birth gave them some seed money to get them going. But there's so many of them, the question was, well, shouldn't we try be trying to work together? So there was a meeting at Irvine, and they agreed they wanted to form a microbiome centers consortium as a way to work together. You know, let's not reinvent the wheel here. Let's learn from each other. So, in fact, um, Simaiki is a member of the Microbiome Centers Consortium, of course. Of course, thank you, that's fun. <laughs> and it's an opportunity to basically work together across universities, also across fields. Because I write in there, not all focused on humans. Many of these centers have no scientists working in the human microbiome. They're all working in environmental or symbiosis or something else. But the point is, we're still asking the same kind of questions, right? What are these microbes doing? What are they providing? How are they being perturbed? How can we restore them? All those kind of things. So we want to add, go across disciplines and ask those kind of questions. This is a beautiful thing. Oh, we wrote a paper recently to invite other universities to join the consortium. So that's what that is. It's a discussion about the need for it and inviting them to join. Oh, and this is my little cartoon um, of trying to figure out all the connections. So you can see all the different topics that are represented by this consortium of, of microbiome centers. Some of them might seem sound kind of funny, and I'll call out one, for example. What is microbiome law and ethics? What do you think that is? Well, I'll give you an example, okay? We're laden with microbes, right? I go to the bathroom, I flush the toilet. I have now said by flushing the toilet that I have no need to keep that. Microbes go down the toilet, somebody goes out. I have, I have recently heard from a colleague that we have a company that goes to the airport and collects the building water from airplanes because they figured out it's the most diverse microbial material they get their hands on. And what they want, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. That doesn't mean, who throw money from that? Because they're gonna isolate microbes from it, they're gonna get new pharmaceuticals, they're gonna do all kinds of things. So I flush my poop down the toilet. If they make a billion dollar product, what happens? Where's my? <laughs> so, I mean, and, and there's all, and also, this, I mean, I could talk about the uh, law and ethics on the microbiome forever. But the point is, there's these other kind of shoot off 
fields that are developing around the microbiome that you might not think of at first. So there will be lawyers in the next generation who will specialize in the microbiome. Mm. For real. For real. Okay, and I want to make a, another remark, okay? Do you remember the graph on the right? That's the one where I showed you that the HMP catalyzed human microbiome research um, at the NRH. But I also want, I put in that yellow block because I want to show the shift, okay, between the growth of microbiome sensors and the NIH funding, there's a lag. And the reason that's important, that means that we've just begun growing microbiome research, just begun. Even though $880 million sounds like a lot of money, no sir, Bob, it is not. This is just growing. <coughs> and not only on him. And I want to come back to Hawaii. I, I don't know if the audience knows this, but Hawaii and the University of Hawaii has an absolutely amazing legacy when it comes to microbiome science, microbial ecology. Because starting in the 1980s, there was a, a long-term monitoring station established in the Pacific Ocean called Station Aloha. And there has been continuous, continuous, non-stop monitoring of those marine microbes since 1988. Wow. How many, yeah, exactly, who said, wow, isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it is amazing, you know. Come hell or high water, there was no stopping that continuous monitoring. And then there was another one established in the Pacific, because, I mean, in the Atlantic, because we want to have these long two, two monitoring stations in the major pelagic bodies of sun surrounding the continental US. But the point is, those data now are getting, are feeding into climate models. And we have this data, long-term data, that's unparalleled. This happened in Hawaii. So what I want to point out is <laughs> Well, I want to talk about this, too, because now we have the next amazing thing that's going to happen with the COBRA uh, activity in the in an Integrated Center for Environmental Microbiome and Human Health and CMIEKI. They are building on the legacy, building on the legacy of Station Aloha and all that meant to the scientific community and now launching it further. So Hawaii is the home of microbiome science. I mean, that's not, a, it's not an exaggeration. We have an amazing legacy here. Thank you.